Hello, and welcome to Right in Front of My Face, the podcast talking about big things happening right in front of us. Thank you for your patience with a blip in my release weeks. Our spring break happened, and all of a sudden, I blinked and April is gone. I took a dreamy vacation, and now I'm back and still focused on season four, COVID pivots. I don't know about all of you, but my kids are locked in a struggle with an addiction to screens. COVID made it exponentially worse, to be sure. There was just so much time together at home. In order to get any headspace, screens were just the first place that many of us went. But now that we're out of lockdown, somehow these devices still have a hold on my kids' brains and it's all they want. I justify it to myself all the time. They're tired. They need a break. They need to socialize through video games. You name it, I've said it to myself to make me feel better. But slowly, all around me, My son's friends are getting iPhones, Apple Watches, and all sorts of devices that scare me a whole lot. I make no judgments, but I personally feel like I'm on the precipice of technology that I'm not ready for. And in my heart of hearts, I don't think my kids are ready for it either. I'm a part of our school's parent board. This will circle back. Stay with me. As a part of our conversations about what parent education events we could put on for our school community, one topic we keep coming back to revolves around kids and screens. Turns out I'm not the only one terrified of cell phones and social media. One parent is so passionate about educating people on the dangers of social media, she connected me with one of her contacts, Emily Churkin, the screen time consultant. Talk about a business that thrived during and after COVID. Emily's job is to counsel families on how to become tech intentional. She's made a business out of helping families figure out how to put their phones down and function more efficiently. Coming out of this pandemic, we need her now more than ever. It turns out that Emily is my neighbor. She lives less than a mile from me and we'd never met. She's been on the Today Show twice, Good Morning America, and has written for the New York Times. Emily is an activist, a mom, and an expert on being not anti-tech, but tech intentional. We're going to learn all about that. Emily and I had one of the most thought-provoking conversations I've had in a very long time. If you are someone who has concerns and questions about whether or not to toss your child into the world of social media, don't move. You need to hear this. Emily says at the beginning of all of her talks to just breathe through the conversation. Don't freak out and do your best not to judge yourself or other parents. Ride the wave of this episode with me. We'll all be better for listening, and I promise you'll come out of it with practical tips you can start applying today. Welcome. Thank you. I have on the podcast today, Emily Churkin, my neighbor my and long lost best friend. I had no idea. Apparently. (laughs) This is like the the epitome of right in front of my face. Yes. Honestly, it's incredible. Uh, Emily is the screen time consultant. You have devoted a consulting practice to helping families become tech intentional rather than tech over, wait, tech intentional. I have it rather than tech overwhelmed. Yes. That's your tagline. And I think it's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I found you through a friend of mine. Our kids go to school together and we had been talking about having a parent education event at our school. And she said this person would be perfect, especially post COVID. And um, so hopefully there will also be a school event, but I also thought you'd be wonderful on this podcast. Thank you. Um, Season four is focused on pivots and successes through COVID. Mm -hmm. And you are somebody who already had this practice established pre COVID, but I'm sure are in a boom now. It's been busy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So your YouTube channel, the Screen Time Consultant, is filled with um, bite-sized tidbits of information that are easily digestible for parents and have been a huge resource for me, honestly, as I've gone down the rabbit hole of research. You are a, a veteran on the Today Show. You've yes. been published in the New York Times. I'm going to try my best to channel my inner Jenna and Hoda, (laughs) but I am not them. It's okay. Um, But I have to say first, thank you so much for spending your very valuable time in this chair to help our listeners figure out how we can come out of COVID in an intentional way after we've had this two years of our kids being planted in front of a screen for two years. Yes. I'm really glad to be here. And I really do love talking about this topic because 
as a parent myself, I'm also living it. So I see it from the expert side, my former teaching background, and then as a parent. So it's a very real thing. So I want to, you know, I have a formula that we usually use, which is tell me a little bit about your background and then let's really kind of get to the meat and then Mm -hmm. let's answer a ton of questions. Um, I put out a call on my Instagram and Twitter today, so we'll see what comes from there. But I have so many questions about tech intentionality and my kids are right about the age where they start asking for a cell phone and start understanding what's happening online. And so I can't wait to get my teeth into this. So if you would give everybody just a little bit of background, um, you started off as a teacher yep. and that kind of led into this. So you can yeah. do your, okay. Yes. My TLDR. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So my name's Emily and I did grow up in Seattle and I have spent the last four or five years really thinking about this issue, but it came to my attention as a classroom teacher because when I first started teaching in 2003, no kid had a smartphone and only like one kid had a flip phone and they were like totally embarrassed by it because it was their parents made them take this embarrassing thing for safety reasons. Isn't it funny how it's changed? That's how it was too. Like you would put the brick of your phone. I kept Mm -hmm. it in the glove box of my car. Right. We used to turn them off until we needed them. (laughs) Right. So then in the 12 years I spent in the classroom, by the time I left the classroom in 2015, 95% of my students had their own smartphones. And I taught seventh grade. So it was middle school years, um, which is, you know, a huge developmental shift Mm -hmm. for kids is lots is happening. And what I realized about halfway through that 12 year period was I couldn't not talk about this with my students. They were coming in, of course it was um, MySpace and then Facebook, which you know no kid is gonna be caught dead on today, but they would come in and talk about things they'd seen online and say, well, I didn't get invited to this party and they posted a picture of all these people who were there and I wasn't there and it made me feel bad. And it was like, oh, hold on. Like this is normal developmental stuff about middle school. Remember middle school? <laughs> all I the do. FOMO and feeling left out and it's awkward. But then it's suddenly magnified. Suddenly they knew all the things that they weren't invited to and included in. And it was consuming. Like the social life I saw in the classroom was consumed by what was happening online outside of the classroom at home. And so I just felt like I can't not talk about this. So we started talking as a, a teacher to student. And I just was asking them a lot of questions and I was definitely taking the like, you really shouldn't do this. It's not healthy adult kind of voice. And then they started pushing back. I owe this all to my students because they said, wait a minute, it's our parents. Our parents are texting and driving. Our parents are scrolling through Facebook till late at night. It's not us or it's not just us. And that's when I realized I was like, this isn't a kid problem. This is a parenting challenge. Oh, that mirror hurts. Yeah. And, and I'm guilty too. Like same full disclosure. Like I come to this, you know, with many choices that in my past, I probably would have done differently knowing what I know now, but that's why I believe that it's never too late to come to this because when we know better, we do better. So you have this experience in the classroom and then what kind of drives you to say, you know what, this is something that families desperately need help with. Yeah. So it was my students bringing it to my attention that really made me think like, wait a second, I got to talk to parents. And so I started pivoting to do more parent education kind of things through the school I was working at. And then actually, and this is all related. I was in a car accident in 2014 and my, I got, I had a TBI and fascinatingly, one of the things the doctor told me was to have brain rest and to stay off screens. And to be, that's TBI is a traumatic brain injury. Yes, a traumatic brain injury. And ironically, you know, more, more small towns. It was just a few blocks from here. <laughs> so all in the neighborhood. Um, and what was shocking to me was like, I knew that spending time on screens probably like, you know, it wasn't great. And I used to make fun of my husband tapping away with his thumbs on his teeny iPhone back in the day when they were smaller and it was weird to see that. And I was sort of, I had this moment of like, well, if this doctor is telling me that in order to heal my brain, I need to be off screens. Does that mean our screen use is going to impact our brains? Like, like, does it go the other way too? That should I be thinking about this? Jeez. Right. So, and I noticed it. And so what happened was it was, it was actually my vision that was affected, but here, I didn't know this vision is how your brain processes what you see. And so if I'm standing in looking at a screen all day, then it's definitely going to impact my vision. So that was a kind of aha moment. 
where I realized, wait a minute, I'm also an adult with a fully formed prefrontal cortex. I get to make decisions because I've developed my brain. I'm well past that full development stage, but kids aren't. And we got to talk about this. Like we can't ignore this. And at the same time as a classroom teacher, all this tech was coming into the classroom. So it used to be, we had like one laptop cart for the whole grade. And we sort of signed up two weeks in advance for one day of laptop use. Suddenly it was, we're going to use this online learning management system. So now your grade book is online. Now we can post homework assignments online. Kids can look their grades up and they don't have to come and talk to you. And I was like, but that's a problem. Right. I want my students to come talk to me because as a middle school teacher, that's probably the most important skill or skills that we can teach them is executive function, how to plan, prioritize, organize, manage their time, problem solve, um, you know, learn to regulate their emotions. That's what middle school is. Content is just a vehicle for skills. Right. And so I started to kind of like, again, that was that early red flag. I was like, wait, this isn't all good. I get there's convenience. I get that. It's streamlined. It's clicking buttons instead of writing in a pad and then transferring it to something else. But I didn't see it as a benefit, a net benefit. Well, you bring up in your YouTube channel too. A lot of us tend to say, you know, I played video games. I would come home from school and watch cartoons. The technology comparison is irrelevant. 100%. At this point. Like, I think it's a place we tend to go where saying like, well, you know, we used to have laptops in school. It is so vastly different now. The usage is different. And you made a point that really resonated with me also is that when we came home from school, there were three shows to watch. Mm -hmm. And I remember it. It was like gummy bears, ducktails, and (laughs) one other, and we could watch those shows or not. And if we missed them, we missed them. But now the vastness of selection of content. It's 24 seven. It's so different. It's all the time. And I think that's something baseline that parents need to stop doing is comparing our tech to theirs. 100%. It's not the same at all. I get that all the time. I watch video or I watch TV and play video games as a kid. I turned out fine. Yeah. But you did not have the internet, first of all. And to your point, there were three shows on. And if it wasn't, what did you, when you said to your parents, when you were a kid, I'm bored, what did they say? Go outside. Yeah. So I did a little informal survey in my social media about this. And I asked that, and it was like 80% of people were like, go outside. And then a few more were like, read a book or do your homework. What do kids hear now? Like if they say I'm bored, what do, we know what they want you to say, which is fine. You can have screen time, but do we respond with go outside, read a book, do your homework. I think the default isn't that anymore. Well, I think the default isn't that, but I will say like in defense of parents, yep. the last two years have been completely off yes. the rails Yes, in terms of like, okay, I'm sorry you're bored, but guess what? I'm trying to have a meeting right now. Yeah. I need you to do whatever you need yeah. to do to occupy yourself. Yeah. And for all kids, that is the iPad. Yep. Yeah. And I think I agree. Or the switch or whatever, you know, right. whatever that is. But it's been survival for so, you know, for now totally. so long, a habit forming amount of time. Right. And two years in a child's 18 years of childhood is a significant amount of time. Actually never thought about that before, but you are correct. Now, and and again, I am always talking about replacing judgment with curiosity because it is super easy to judge right. other people and other parents and ourselves. Um, and so- I definitely don't think there's much room for judgment. It doesn't move us forward. Everyone is going to do it differently. Every family is going to do it differently. And that's okay. The important thing is that you're doing this intentionally and you know the decisions you make are grounded in things you've learned about and in your family's values. So let's get to this yeah. because your your tagline is profound to me. Thank you. Moving from being tech intentional from being tech overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. That intentionality for me resonated hard as I started kind of digging into your YouTube channel because just the other day I was sitting with my kids, my daughter was sick and she was kind of cuddled into me watching a movie and I was on my phone trying Mm -hmm. to do some emails and try and she goes, mom, I need you to put down your phone and watch this Mm -hmm. movie with me. And that hits because you're like, I'm not present in this moment with you. I have other stuff to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, sorry, you have the stomach flu. It's a total bummer, right. but, right. but it really, it caught me off guard yeah. and I'm yeah. like, 
okay, you're watching. Yeah. You're this seven, is, you are yeah. seven years old and you are watching me and you know yep. that this pulls me away. Yeah. There was a, um, aha moment in our house too, where my husband was putting my son to bed at about age seven or eight. And he did the like lie on the bed and had his phone kind of on the down low, like scrolling while, while Max was trying to go to sleep and Max sat up and he looked at Ben and he goes, daddy, I can't compete with your iPhone. <gasps> and we were like, Oh, that is oh, accurate. They, they, see it. they do. And see, this is the important thing that we have to remember as parents it for better or worse, our kids are watching and learning. We are their first technology use role models and we're not going to do it perfectly. And that's okay. So in my mind, that's a great example, right? Your daughter and you, and you can, you know, in those moments, I think parents instinct is to react defensively. I think there is an opportunity to be intentional, which is thank you for pointing that out. I hear you want to be with me. I'm going to finish this. And then I'm putting my phone over there and joining you. So it doesn't have to escalate. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. have to become a battle. Well, and I think taking what you said and really taking to heart in the curious way, rather than the judgmental way, even towards ourselves yes, is like, yeah, you just got called out. Mm-hmm. Like I just got called out mm-hmm. and you're like, thank you. You mm-hmm. are a hundred percent correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And real, I mean, that's a tough thing. And, and I will say once again, I am a stay at home mom. My job is mm-hmm. not outside of the home. And so I'm not trying to work. I'm not trying to, you know, scrounge whatever time I, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I recognize that right. privilege as a piece of where I of course. sit in being able to receive that call out. Yes. Right. Yes, so that's absolutely. different to all working parents out there. Right. I don't know how you do it. And I don't yeah. think you should feel bad about it. Well, and it's, it's, you know, there's choice and there's need and it's hard both ways. Working yes. parents are hard, stay at home, you know, have hard time, stay at home parents yeah. have a hard time. And, but and as we're talking about judgment, I just, yeah. I guess I want people out there to know that like, this is a battle that we are all in yes. together. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when your kid is homesick and you have to work, that's the thing that's going to happen. Yep. So what my call out is, I guess I just want to diffuse that bomb a little bit totally. of, of judgment. Yeah. And again, I think your point about the last two years being really, it, it's the exception rather than the rule. And what we can say is, you know, the last two years have been not normal yeah. in, in our family life. And it's not going to be normal again in the way it was before, but we get to talk about that with our kids. It's all part of the conversation. So this is what we did. This is what we're doing now. And this is how it's going to be different in the future. Just prepping them that way. We are here with Cassie Walker Johnson with Johnson and Walker with Windermere. First question I have for you, Cassie, if a seller wants to maximize their return on investment, what should they be focused on? The most important thing that you can focus on is flooring, lighting, painting, and yard cleanup. Those are the first four items that we always go to, to really help a client update with a way that gives the house a real sparkle. And then from there, if they want to do further investment, we always recommend focusing on kitchens and bathrooms. Those are the first two things that make the biggest impression when somebody's coming to look at their home and therefore you'll get a higher return on investment. Cassie, do you give people advice on these four ways to make their home sparkle? Not only do we give advice, but we help manage it. We bring the vendors, we offer full concierge service so that we can help you get the best bang for your buck. You all can find Cassie at johnsonandwalker.com. See you there. So I think this is a great segue into kind of my first big question about how you recommend really being in control of our time because phones aren't going away. iPads aren't going away. These things are with us forever. Mm -hmm. We have to accept it. And we also have to deal with them being a permanent fixture in our lives. Mm -hmm. So where I kind of want to start is talking about the actual device itself Mm -hmm. and how it is intentionally designed to be as yes. addictive as possible. Yes. This is the first thing, like, I feel like I watched The Social Dilemma a year ago when it came out and I was so shocked about what I didn't know, but you deal with this very upfrontly. Yeah. So I want you to talk about that. Yeah, I, I feel like there are two things that parents have to understand any time we're making a screen-related decision. One of them is executive function skills, which we just talked about a little bit. The second is persuasive design. Parents need to know that tech companies have hired developmental psychologists to design their products to hook and hold our attention. 
And again, as adults, in theory, we have control over that. But how many as of how many of us have stayed up late at night just one more episode or doom scrolling through social media? Right, we're guilty of uh, every literally yes, every night. Right. So for our children, they lack the ability to with you know to not be influenced by that. And so when we're we're talking about dopamine, literally like brain chemicals here, where the use of the product is designed to tap into the feel good hormones. And so when our kids are using their devices, they're getting this hit of hormones. It feels good. So when you take it away, what happens? You've interrupted this flow of feel good hormones and they flip their lid, tantrum, meltdown, screaming, yelling, whatever it is, it looks different for every kid. And it's awful. But what I always say to parents is it's not a fair fight. You are not fighting your kid. You are fighting their hijacked neural pathway. It's literally designed to do that. So until we understand that as parents, we aren't ever going to be able to address the conflict that comes up. So it's interesting that you say this because uh, there is a real difference between when my, and, and it's specific really to my daughter. My mm -hmm. son doesn't fight this battle as much, but for my daughter, when she has her Kindle or her iPad with her headphones, mm -hmm. the reaction of even when there's a timer, even when the thing shuts off, she loses her marbles. Mm -hmm. And it is so different than asking her to turn the TV off, mm -hmm. which is very mm -hmm. rare. Talk to me about that. Yeah, not all screen time is created equal. So yeah. even within the screen time battles, they may be different depending on whether it's a video they're watching or a game they're playing. And so it might have to do with the design element, right? Like if you're going to watch Mr. Rogers, which is hilarious to go and watch old videos of them. It's so slow. What yeah. you'll notice right away is how slow the pacing is because it was built for children yep. to be developmentally appropriate. No child show today is developmentally, I shouldn't say no, but most are not designed to actually be appropriate for what that brain stage is in a child's development. So that's a problem, right? So then kids expect this rapid um, reward experience, right? Whether it's from the show or from the game. So you know, during the pandemic, I got this question a lot. Well, is it okay to FaceTime with grandma, right? Like that we're having a lot more of that because we can't see yeah. them. Of course, that isn't an issue. And even the American Academy of Pediatrics exempts um, FaceTiming with relatives as an, you know, not screen related. Interesting. But the problem is, again, it's so much of it's about your environment, your context, how long you've been doing it, what your, what your mood, your state you're in when we go in, you know, if you're, are you hungry? Are you tired? Like there's a lot of factors that are going to influence our reaction. And what I always tell parents is we have to assume that there is going to be a reaction, whatever it is for each child, right. whatever device they're using. And so we have to build in time for that. And we have to assume that when we say we get screen time or we're giving screen time, that the meltdown is part of that agreement. We just accept that that goes with it. It's not one without the other. It's Interesting. always together. So like when I am trying to get my kids ready for, they, so they get screens after school. Mm -hmm. It's TV. Mm -hmm. I've learned that my six-year-old cannot handle the Kindle. Yeah. Like, but it show is fine. Yeah. But I do have to, if we have anywhere to go, it is, we stop 15 minutes before we have to go anywhere to build Great. the time of coming out of it. Yes. Cause that is a totally real yeah. thing. Yeah. Again, you think about that interruption of the dopamine. So one thing is to game plan ahead of time to say, I know that when we turn it off, it's really hard. We need, we need to build in the transition. What helps you burn off that excessive energy or feeling that you're having. It might be run up and down the stairs 10 times. It might be, you know, I don't know, jump, jumping yeah. jack, something just to like get that energy out so that you can transition to the next thing. So the first piece is knowing that this device yeah. is sort of like a slot machine. Yeah. Actually, can I tell you one other quote that yes, I think is do. highly powerful? There are only two industries. This isn't my line. There are only two industries that call their consumers users, drugs and tech. That's upsetting when you. Yeah. When you think about it, we're users. We're users of technology, right? That's what they call us. That's what's referred to. So, I mean, th there is, there's lots of, st I'm happy to give you links too. So your, your listeners can look at some of these articles about the hijacked brain and the way that these industry you know, people are designing their products. And P.S., the industry, people who are doing this send their children to Waldorf schools. They don't give them tech till they're teenagers. Right. They know. I, but I think that was the most alarming piece of the social dilemma is having the CEOs of Twitter, yes. everybody saying, oh, no, my kid is never getting this. Yeah. So why are we 
so okay with it as parents? Because we don't necessarily know, but I also think there is a lot of guilt and shame as parents because we know that we're guilty of using it ourselves and being susceptible to the doom scrolling and the, you know, extra looping of the episodes, which by the way, is a design technique. Uh, I mean, a hundred percent. That's what the YouTube algorithm is. Right. Yep. And you don't click to keep you going designed to keep your eyeballs on it. Yep. Yep. The less work you have to do, the longer you'll stay on it. So there are things you can do to make that harder for you, which will decrease your time. But even I just think it's number one is the awareness of it, that you know that that's happening. And the insidious part of this is that you end up gaslighting yourself because you're like, I know it's a problem and I can control it. And then you still do it because it's tapped into your brain. I mean, again, this is the thing, like we really aren't fighting our kids. We are fighting their, you know, hijacked neural pathways and we're not even fighting ourselves. You know, we're hiding, we're fighting our own influenced brains by this. I remember when I left my job to have my son. And it was a job that required you to kind of be on 24 seven. Um, and I loved it, but it was a real thing. And I remember seeing that blue light on my phone. Um, and I would kind of get a little like heart rush when I left my job. It took me probably almost six months to not look at my phone every five seconds. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And to not, to like realize that I had to come down off of that. It w- it was the phone was the hardest piece of not working yeah. anymore. It was yeah. such a pattern in me and, and a literal physical response. Mm-hmm. And really, if you pay attention, I think to the ding of your text or whatever, you can feel your heartbeat or what you yes. notice it as a physical response. Yes. And actually you mentioned slot machines and that's Tristan Harris of the Center for Humane Tech who was featured in the social Mm -hmm. drama talks about this. Our phones are like slot machines. And the back part of that is that it's a term psychologists use called intermittent variable rewards. So what's happening when we get new notifications or likes or text alerts, they come at random intervals. They're not predictable. So what's ironic is, do you remember back in Blackberry days where you would get notifications pushed to you in like 10 minute increments or 15 minute increments? Mm -hmm. That has a different effect on our brain because we know it's coming in 10 minutes. So we aren't anticipating, will I get it? Will it be a new email? Will there be a like? Will somebody write back? Because we just know in 10 minutes, we'll see it. So the irony is it's actually better if we set it to dump us, you know, every 10 or 15 minutes. And so that intermittent variable reward is what keeps us checking that, you know, you open your inbox and then you close it immediately and open it again, just in yes, case. And you refresh, see, refresh. Or if you're expecting a yeah. tracking info or something. Exactly. Exactly. So that's crazy. So, yeah. so starting off as a parent, knowing this, you're like, okay, I can't handle it. Yeah. Whenever I check Instagram, invariably I find something that makes me feel bad about myself. Mm-hmm. And I, I have several examples of this, mm-hmm. even as a grown up that I, you know, can't wait to share. <laughs> but what is the first thing? So, so my son is 10 and a half, several kids in his class have phones. What is the first thing that should go into my decision-making? Because mm-hmm. for me, aside from meeting you, aside from seeing my, my, in our family, we have said, we are not going to do phones until as long as humanly possible. Yeah. But say that changes and, mm-hmm. you know, my kid wants to be a part of the class texturing or whatever. What's the first, what's the first step? Yeah. Well, I have a lot of thoughts on this. I think definitely the very first thing is to do what you're doing, which is to ground your decision in your family's values. And that is to think this doesn't feel right. So we're going to wait. And the hard thing is when you're one of the only families that feels that way or is delaying. But I will tell you this. I've talked to lots and lots of parents. Not one of them has ever said to me, I wish I gave a phone sooner. Never. It's always, I wish I had waited. I wish I had known what I know now. So I say that again, without judgment, if you've already done it, it's never too late to make changes, but it is so much harder to take it away if you've already given it. So delay, delay, delay is definitely the way to go. If and for as long as possible. And we did that too. My son was eighth grade, but. So tell me about the conversation with your child when they are like, I am missing out. Yeah. Everybody else has this. Where do we come from as parents say no good comes of that text string? I know. And this is the hardest part because here we are ironically making our own child feel like they're missing out because now they're not 
getting what all the other kids are getting in terms of having tech or social right. media or whatever. And it used to be <laughs> when we saw what was happening, this is what I tell parents is like FOMO doesn't go away when you give them a phone. It just magnifies it. You see everything you miss out on. You, you hear all the mean comments. So I, I so profoundly agree with this. It's interesting. I've kind of slowed up on my personal Instagram page mm-hmm. and I've focused, I actually have way more fun with my podcast page. Awesome. Because I've curated it to be things that are interesting to me. And, but, but invariably when I check my personal Instagram, I have cried over things that I have seen mom's nights that I haven't been invited to. It has been a source of pain for me. Mm -hmm. I am 44 years old almost. Yeah. Yeah. Why on earth do we expect kids to be able to handle it? That's exactly my question because we're humans are social creatures. We need other people and we need validation from other people. And some people might say, well, that's stupid. You should have, feel good about yourself and love yourself. And no, but we're, we're social creatures. We need each other. And so when we see things where we're not included right. or we get the, you know, I, my feeling is always like I get the hundred likes and the hundred good comments and it's the one negative one that I fixate on, 100%. right? But it's completely imbalanced. 99 to one is a pretty clear ratio, a ratio, right? So that's, again, that's normal. That's our humanity, But again, I completely agree with you. How are we supposed to expect 12 year olds to figure this out if it's hurting us at 44? Hey everybody, John Gruss with Element Mortgage here again. And we're still dealing with a pretty crazy real estate market, especially on the lending side. Interest rates are still incredibly low. So if you have not had an opportunity to refinance your current home yet, what are you waiting for? Rates are great. Reach out to us. We'll be happy to provide you your options. Secondarily, our homes are all increasing in value. Great chance to potentially tap into some of that equity by utilizing a cash out refinance option. Again, the rates are still incredibly low on that. And you've got an opportunity to tap into the equity for either home improvements, maybe some debt consolidation, whatever that additional cash may be beneficial for. Last, if you're buying a home, you've probably seen the news. It's crazy out there. The market is hot. What's going to be incredibly important is that you have a lender that can help you navigate this process by explaining what's going on, how to strategically position your offer so that it's accepted in a market where sellers are getting multiple offers on properties. And at Element Mortgage, we're happy to do that. We're licensed in 49 states. Sorry, New York. Unfortunately, we're not able to assist. But please reach out to me, John, J-O-N dot Gruss, G-R-U-S at elementmortgage.com or 206-954-4787. John Gruss, NMLS number 110-8421. Element Mortgage is a division of American Pacific Mortgage. NMLS number 1850, equal housing opportunity. They don't They don't really know about Instagram, but I have started asking them for permission to put photos yes, up Yes, because I don't think that we should be necessarily allowed to create a digital footprint for our kids that they might not want. I mean, I think yeah. again, with segues, this goes into talking about the permanence yeah. of what happens on social media. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. It, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, and I always, when I was a teacher, I used to make my kids look at um, Snapchat and the terms of agreement, terms and agree, you know, terms and conditions, you know, mm-hmm. read the user agreement. How many of us just click and don't even read it? All, all of us, that, which okay. is why Snapchat can do what they do. Yep. And here's a, ha- okay, here's two really easy tips. If you're thinking about getting your kids any sort of a social media account, first of all, and we were talking about this earlier, make yourself a fake account, read the terms and conditions with your kid, like go through the whole thing. It's boring and it's, it's designed that way so that you'll not pay attention to the fine print. When I taught this with my students, we'd look through the fine print of Snapchat and Snapchat's whole premise is it deletes. Right. Literally in their terms and conditions, it says, we cannot guarantee, we cannot guarantee deletion of a snap. So you're getting it with thinking you're getting one thing, but it even says in their thing that they can't promise it because you can take screenshots and now there's all sorts of secondary. Well, stuff. but that's, I mean, this is the whole thing where nothing has ever gone because you don't know who has grabbed that. I mean, how many celebrities yeah. have tried to delete tweets and well, there are a million screen grabs. And them. why do you, my first question is why do you need something that deletes tweets or messages? What's needing to be deleted? 
what's the content that you're hiding, right? right? That's to me, that's an invitation to an underdeveloped brain to do something risky. And that's developmentally normal. Kids take risks. They do stupid things because they're not fully formed. But when you do that on the internet, the stakes are a lot higher and it follows you. It doesn't go anywhere. So that to me, that is kids don't understand that and parents have to because they can't. But I think most parents don't understand that too. Right. So that's the other thing then is to go, I made a, I wrote an article about it. I can give you the link. It's about, I made a fake Snapchat account as a 43 year old pretending to be a 15 year old because I'd watched the congressional hearings with Snapchat, YouTube executives, and they're going on and on about how their platform is safe for 13 and up. They totally moderate content, blah, blah, blah. And then I said, fine, I'll go make a fake account. And within 10 seconds, and I pretended to be 15, I gave them nothing else. 10 seconds, I was getting pushed soft porn, inappropriate like relationship stuff, innuendos, stuff that like certainly at best would confuse a child, but at worst mess their thinking up. I mean, how would I explain any of those things? So if you want to get your kid Snapchat or Instagram or TikTok is the big one right now, of course, go make a fake account and then spend an hour on it and decide, am I ready for my 11 year old to see everything I'm seeing? So- I could talk about this forever, but me too. <laughs> the, so I kind of, I'm trying to keep track of my, so first, your first piece is delay, 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 as long as you possibly can. Yeah. If the decision has been made that your kid gets a phone and that's what your family's decided. Awesome. Take the time to understand the apps that they're using. Mm-hmm. I think that piece is so important. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't thought about it until you just said, create a fake Snapchat Snapchat account. Mm -hmm. And I had talked to you earlier about, I got on TikTok. I'm not, I don't understand it. It scares me a little bit. Um, but all I did was make my account. I gave my real age and immediately got push porn, Mm -hmm. like it right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? I don't, I never, that is not one of the interests Mm-mm. that I clicked. No. <laughs> I did not. I, I, where's the fashion? Yeah. Not. So it's alarming. I think that a lot of us don't even bother to use the tech that our kids are using. Yep. Now that said, it's virtually impossible to keep up with it all. Well, that's the other thing is we are creating more work for ourselves. Right. And, and, you know, parents ask me all the time, what parental controls do you recommend? And I don't recommend parental controls. I recommend parenting. And I put a little asterisk, asterisk on that because it's not only our responsibility. I mean, yes, it is because we're the parents, but we have to remember the role the tech companies are playing. But, you know, the problem with parental controls, I had a parent tell me she's up until two in the morning every night monitoring her daughter's social media accounts. Well, how is that quality of life good for anybody, mom or daughter? And also it doesn't really account for the fact that most kids have a faux Instagram. Exactly. A Finsta. A Finsta. Yeah. And it doesn't exempt us from parenting. Like parental controls only do so much. So if you have ones that you like, I always say to families, like, fine, keep them. I'm not going to tell you to get rid of something if you like it. But if it's not solving any of the problems, then there's another piece to this, which is the parenting part where you have to talk about this stuff and you got to model what you want your kids to be doing. I'm going to make myself a fake TikTok because that is such an intriguing thing, but I think we really need to know. So parents, get on the apps, figure Mm -hmm. out what this is about. I've tried Snapchat before and I'm like, this is no good comes of this. Yeah. And I want to, you know, you made a comment about like school chat threads and stuff too. I am really angry at how much tech has infiltrated schools and I'm mad at a lot of different things about it. But one of the problems is because of the pandemic, schools invested millions of dollars in technology-based tools and products. They're not going to walk away from it. It's not going anywhere. And parents have the right to say, uh, no, this does not work. This is not developmentally healthy. This isn't what good learning looks like. I mean, parents tell me they have to demand paper and pencil for their child in school. How absurd is that? And this has only changed in the last five, maybe six years. So, and much more so because of the pandemic. So parents can push back. And again, there are ways to do this respectfully. I have template letters that I have ready to go to say, I'm exempting my kid from online, you know, mental health surveys, for example, or you know, my child needs to take their tests on paper, not on a computer because they're seven, right? That that's not what seven-year-olds need. And so that one of the problems is we use tech for tech's sake just because it's there, but it's not actually better for learning or brain development. So school used to be the place that we could go that was relatively screen-free or screen light. That is not the case anymore. And I think that's 
pretty broadly true across the country. And I am deeply concerned about that. I think we need to talk for just a second also, because you actually do know what you are talking about because of your advocacy. Yes. You are the co-founder of the Student Data Privacy Project. Yes. So. Oh yeah. There's a whole, (laughs) we could do a whole podcast just on that. Yes. So I do feel like, I mean, you do have a lot of credibility on this topic and your advocacy work. Um, Okay. So we've given the kid the phone. We've gotten on the apps. We've figured out what's what. Yep. Can you, we know they're addictive. Mm-hmm. So we're going to set up the phone for our kids. Mm-hmm. What's the first thing that we do? That's a good question. I, I actually think it has nothing to do with the phone itself. It has everything to do with how we set up the expectations around the use of it. So not the controls, not the, like, what do we download? So use me as a clean slate. Okay. okay. Use okay. me as a, use me as a case study. Okay. I have activated an old iPhone for my 11 year old mm-hmm. who says that he wants it to walk back and forth from school really deep down me as a parent. I want to know where they're at. Mm-hmm. I want to be able to text them any plan changes during the day, because I will say this. And again, this is a place, not a place of judgment. Mm-hmm. And you can correct me if I'm wrong it seems like from an observational perspective, the reason kids get phones a lot of times is for parents' convenience. Yep. And safety. I think parents worry about safety, but here's the thing. And I'm going to push back on that because you are telling me that it is safer to give your child unlimited access to the internet than to let them walk home from school. And to me, those risks are vastly different. It's, it's, I understand it because as parents, we worry about the like scary headline things, but Walking back and forth from school is still pretty safe activity. And the other piece of this, we are, in my opinion, taking away really important opportunities for building confidence, showing our kids we trust them, helping them develop executive function skills that they need to be successful later in life. They don't need tech skills. They need executive function skills. So what happens if your kid gets lost on the way home from school? I mean, I would assume at some point he's going to know how to get home, but you know, he's going to have to problem solve. Does he know who to ask? Does he know how to ask for help? Does he know that the schools have phones in their offices that he can call and say, I lost my lunch or whatever it is, right? We, we actually make our children more dependent in a way that I don't think we realize it's actually not serving them. And again, there are alternatives. Like my son had a flip phone. So this is what I actually recommend. If you're really feeling that need to get your child a phone, a flip phone, you know, it's not perfect, but right. it's better in my mind than a smartphone. So it's interesting because this whole idea of kid getting lost. Mm-hmm. My son asked for an Apple watch when we went to Disneyland. We just took a trip to Disneyland and he was super worried that he was going to get lost at Disneyland. Mm. And so we had this whole conversation about like, no, there are cast members at Disneyland, anybody with a name tag you find and you will stay and they will know what to do. You know, my phone number. Yep. That's so good. And I'm going to have it. And you either that, so you can't find a cast member and you're panicked. You find a mom. That's what I tell my kids. Disneyland is full of moms Mm -hmm. that will help you. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're probably not going to lose each other, but I'm not going to get you a phone Cause you're worried about getting lost at Disneyland. And you did exactly what I would say to parents, which is scenarios, walk through possible things that might happen. Because again, our job is number one job as parents is to keep our kids safe. And I realize that parents are going to say, well, but that's why I'm giving them a phone. But the safety risks that come with the phone are much greater than the safety risks of letting them walk home without one. But that is so profound. And when you put it like that, it really does make so much sense. So Seriously. I, and and again, I have to say it's obvious, but I feel very strongly about this, right? Like yeah. I'm not trying to hide my opinion. And it's very hard for me to be impartial about this topic because I am very passionate about yeah. it. But I want you to talk, speaking to the safety of having a phone mm-hmm. and a TikTok, talk about what came out in the New York Times today. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So there was a um, story about a 13 year old girl who has TikTok fame and is getting money monetizing her online experiences and had a stalker essentially show up at her house and shoot open the front door of her family's home. The gun jammed. 
The dad, who was a former cop, tried to chase him away. It's it's a it's a horrific story. And the thing, I know that the first reaction to reading the article for a lot of people is going to be to judge the parents. And I have my opinions about this because the kid is still on TikTok. The parents decided it was still fine for her to have her TikTok account. And I have an opinion about that. But what is problematic to me is when I sort of zoom out, I think we stop thinking of children as children at about 12, which is problematic because from a brain standpoint, we're children technically into our twenties or even thirties in terms of brain development. But really, do you know college students who make smart decisions 24 seven? No, it's because again, that brain is not fully developed. No. And how many of us have said, thank God that we didn't have this, that we had anonymity and the ability to screw up. Yes. Because, and that's what I loved about teaching middle school. It was a safe place to do stupid things and try again in a non-judgmental environment. And it doesn't stick with you. You can do something dumb at a party and, and it wouldn't live with you for the rest of your life. People moved on and forgot. No. And, and so by not moving on and not forgetting we're creating such stress, anxiety. I mean, the mental health crisis right now to me is, is the really worrisome thing for young people, but we can't trust that kids are going to just have this experience and not be affected by it. You know, to your point that Instagram, even as an adult can cause us to have an emotional response. So it, again, I think those, there are definitely the clickbaity headlines that, you know, people are going to push back and say, well, that's just one extreme example. Well, there's a lot packed into that article. I mean, I I recommend reading it to get more of it. But I I think the bigger message is, are we okay with a tech company changing our child's childhood so dramatically, monetizing our child's childhood? Like, are we okay with that? I mean, I think that's the question we have to answer. I want to repeat what you just said. These are changing our child's childhood. Mm Mm-hmm. These devices are changing our child's childhood. That is a profound statement and it is 100% correct. And we don't get a do-over. I say that not to freak people out. I do believe that we can always do better. But again, from the brain development standpoint, it's now. It's like, you know, the birth to five is that big brain growth. And then adolescence. We, We don't get more chances later. And so adults, adulthood is hard enough, right? Hi, yeah. parents in a pandemic, right? Why are we going to make our children's childhood harder? It's less is more here. I mean this again, and I get it. Like I hear that social pressure all the time, but other parents are doing it and all these other kids have it. It's we're the one. And I said this to you earlier, this is our big tobacco moment. There's going to be retroactive litigation there's going to be long-term studies because we don't have long-term studies. This no, is like a five-year-old, 10-year-old problem at most that show the harm. This is my opinion. And, and I say to my kids who tell me I'm the worst mother in the world because I don't let them play video games during the week, right? And they do get video How games. dare time. you? I know, right? But I, <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only parent who's been told that. But I say to them, I am literally fighting for your future cognitive and emotional health. That's why I'm doing this. You don't have to like it. And P.S. parents, kids don't like what we say all the time. This is not new to this parenting generation. No, that's all parents all the time. Well, I think we lose sight of that. I think we think we're supposed to be their friends and they, they're, they're supposed to like us. And then our insecurity climbs, maybe because we're spending too much time on social media, but we don't need our kids to like us. And I think we have gotten into this rut of feeling like other people need to like us too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, FOMO, <laughs> adult version. Yeah. 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 I, um, I just, this is going to stick with me for a long time, what you just said. And I'm, I want to backtrack because why are we trying to make our children's childhood harder? Mm -hmm. That is exactly what it does. Can you tell me any, I mean, you said earlier, there are no parents that, that wish they would have given their kids Mm -hmm. phones earlier. Can you give me some examples of parents that really have had strong experiences saying this has been a super detriment or on the other side, any parents who have said, this has been awesome for my family. And this is why, because I want to present both sides of that coin. Mm. If there are. Yeah. I was going to say, I I'm always a little wary of the both sides ism because in some ways I don't think there's 
I don't think the few benefits outweigh the tremendous risk and harm, potential for harm. Um, again, I always say I'm not anti-technology, I'm tech intentional. So like, again, I have a phone, my kids, my eighth grader has a phone, but I've also spent years prepping for this. So what I hear, I mean, just, just in the last week, one dad told me a random YouTuber has more influence on my child than I do. Are we okay with that? Another mom told me that her 10 year old is so addicted to computer games, um, that he will do nothing else. Doesn't care. Doesn't want to do anything. He's on two different types of medication. Right. And again, I mean, I'm, I'm sweeping a broad stroke here. It may be a lot of other issues going on, but are we okay with that? Another mom told me that her six-year-old would not even go to the playground anymore because he didn't want to give up his iPad time. Whoa. Six-year-old doesn't want to go to the playground. Are we okay with that? And again, I say this to parents because we have to be aware of it. It is our job. And I, you know, again, I, I don't want parents to walk away from this feeling like I've shamed you and beat you up, but I don't exempt you. We have to parent. We have to get educated about this. We have to learn what the tech companies are doing. We have to see. And again, you know what? Do an experiment. I mean, this is the thing too. I don't ever tell parents to go cold turkey because it backfires, but prep for that possibility or prep for a day. So one day we did a, um, we, I actually did the thing which parents do, which is if you don't do X, I'm going to take away screen time, which we've all said. And Correct. I ended up saying for a whole month, and this was like four or five years ago. And I thought, oh my gosh, I just punished myself, right? We have a trip coming up. I hate flying. So there goes screens even on the airplane. I had to pack differently. The first week was awful. My kids were awful. They hated me. They begged, cried, meltdown. And the second week was not as bad. And the third week they started playing together and they were pulling toys off the shelf they hadn't touched in months. And I had this moment of like, I needed to see this. And so then I did an experiment on my own children, which was to have a screen of Palooza day. And I just said, you can have screen time from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., but you have to eat three meals and you can't have it after 5 p.m. I did put some parameters because high nutrition and all that yeah, yeah. parenting stuff. And my daughter came up at noon and ate lunch and then went back down to her, whatever she was doing. And I will say, I got a ton of stuff done that day. It was great. I was the most productive I've yeah. ever been on a Sunday. Yep. And at five o'clock, my daughter came up and she goes like, is it lunchtime yet? And I was like, that was five hours ago. And she goes, did I eat lunch? She had no idea. And then she has like a watch that does a step count. It's not internet connected, don't worry, but it does have like yeah. steps. And then she looked at her watch and she goes, wow, I only got like 200 steps today. This is a kid who gets regularly 10 to 12,000 steps a day. And she's like, that's weird. She had no concept of time and she was shocked that she hadn't gotten She'd been her steps. like literally in a virtual casino all day. Yeah. Yeah. So I took that, that was really for us, the sort of my breaking point was like, oh, this matters. This, the limits matter. And again, you know, cold turkey is a risky approach and you have to go into it with a lot of intention and a lot of planning and, you know, talk. It's a marketing campaign with your kids, really. You got to sell this to them. Right. And it's positive. We're going to do this as a family. We're going to try something new. And maybe that's not the, the right approach for everybody. Like, I definitely don't recommend starting there. But can I, can I give you a tip of what I do recommend? That yes, it is all good? the tips, okay. all of it. So one of my favorite things to do, and it's totally free, it's just live your life out loud. And what I mean by that is we narrate what we do as we do it when it comes to screens and tech. So it might be we're upstairs, you know, it's dinner time, whatever. I'm reaching for my phone and I say, I'm reaching for my phone. I'm going to look at my calendar because I want to see what our schedule is tomorrow. Or I'm going to open an app and look for a recipe for cooking dinner. Or I'm checking the weather. You just say it out loud what you're saying all the time. And you do it so much that your kids roll their eyes at you. But here's what you're doing. You are modeling how you use it. You are showing them that it is a multi-tool. I always say it's a Swiss army knife, not a switchblade, right? Our phones do so many things. You are showing them, um, and you, you can add in the emotional piece of it. You can say, gosh, I'm bored and I'm reaching for Instagram and I'm scrolling and there's no end to this feed and I don't feel better. We're giving them emotional vocabulary words to talk about how it makes us feel when we spend on time on the screen. Um, we're showing that even in moments of boredom, we want screen time and we can talk about how it's hard for us to put it down. See, that's really interesting because my kids have, as I said, called me out on being on the phone and you're like, you don't understand. I'm looking at our calendar. I'm organizing. Yeah, I'm they don't know that. Signing you up yeah. for water polo. I'm doing right. all these things, but they don't know that unless no. we tell them. No, if you think about the perspective, I used to, I always give this example. When I lived in New York City, I loved riding the subway to work. And this was like in 2000, so pre-smartphone. 
And I loved sitting on this subway train and watching all these newspapers in different languages all around me and being like, oh, I'm part of this big global, you know, humanity. <laughs> like, it's amazing. Well, what's happening now? I go ride the subway and everybody's looking at their phone. They might all still be reading their foreign language newspapers, but I have no way to know. I can't tell. And so even though it looks the same, I don't feel more connected. I feel more totally. disconnected. My husband says, you know, this is, this is such a common problem too, is, you know, when your phone text makes a noise and goes off and interrupts mm -hmm. whatever you're doing. So here's another tip. Just turn off all the sounds, all the sounds, notifications, alerts. Well, sh shut your notifications off, period. But even your texts, turn off the sound. Don't necessarily have to turn off the fact that like your phone will light up when it comes, but it doesn't make a sound because my husband always says, texting is giving someone who's not even in the room permission to interrupt you. Are we okay with that? Is it okay? I love what you're saying after all these, like, are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. And I get, I, I am the worst at letting texts interrupt me and voice texts and all. I mean, it's really like, as I said, it's the painful call out as a parent of mm -hmm. saying, mm, actually, you're doing this too. And yeah. so do we want this for our kids? Um, well, and that's a lot of the work I do with parents. They come to me because they're worried about their kids' screen time, but the work starts with us. Yeah. We have to talk about our screen use. And again, not not shaming and not judging. I'm, I'm right here with you working this yeah. out myself, but living your life out loud is a really easy way to start doing this because it, it gives you that accountability, right? So like, it's like when you write down what you eat, you pay more attention to what you eat. Same thing here. If I'm going to say, oh, I have a text from my friend, I'm going to look at it. Your kid now knows what you're doing. And you can even say, I apologize for interrupting you. I'm going to look at that text in a minute, or this is something really important. Could you hold on one second? I will be right back. Right. I want to talk a little bit about, um, something you say that resonated with me and that is prioritizing sleep. Yes. Um, because I do see how this could be a huge problem mm -hmm. in the addictive nature of it. It is for me. Like mm -hmm. I, I multi-screen at night and I have my phone and my TV Mm -hmm. And I love them both mm -hmm. equally, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, <laughs> but my kids don't have screens in their rooms. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we have actually talked about. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're welcome to come in here. We can watch a show, but your room is for sleep. So I am the person that slept trained my kids mm -hmm. to the point where my friends were making fun of me. Cause I would leave everywhere at seven o'clock and be like, Nope, yeah. we're going to bed. Like yep. this was just something for me that mm -hmm. is a high priority in life. Um, Talk to me about how screens mm -hmm. interfere with that mm -hmm. and developmentally what that looks like. Sleep is the low hanging fruit. If you're going to change anything about screen time, start with sleep. Don't even have to be about screens, right? Like this is what parents think we have to start by locking down the phones and doing all this. Let's start by prioritizing sleep because screens are so loaded. Our kids know that we get mad at them about how much they use them, even if we're being hypocritical. So let's not even mention screens. Let's just talk about the importance of sleep. And there's all kinds of research about how kids aren't getting enough sleep. Adults aren't getting enough sleep. Like this is, it, it's true. And we know as sleep deprived parents, how much we feel like zombies and mushy brained. And their kids are falling asleep in school because they're up till two, three, four in the morning on social media, scrolling through the night. I mean, again, low hanging fruit is phones should never be in the bedroom because it affects sleep, right? That to your point, if that's not where you are, if that's, something that you haven't done, don't take it away right away. Again, we got to baby step it. So it's like, Hey, I've been reading about sleep. Sleep is one of the most important things we can do for our brains and our bodies. And I haven't done a good job. See, this is another thing, parents, we got to sometimes eat a little bit of crow. We got to say, I learned something and now I'm going to make a different decision because I know more now. And what I know is that the sleep piece is so important that we're going to prioritize that as a family. So you can ask your kids, it depends on the age, of course, but you can say like, how can I help you get more sleep? What's something I can do to help you sleep better at night so you can enjoy your day? Right. So you can stay awake right. in class, so you can hang out with your friends, whatever it is. And then you keep it positive. And so then it's like, okay, I think the phone might be keeping you up at night. I mean, some parents shut off the Wi-Fi at night, but the, here's the thing, the kids always find the workaround. This is like- that, This is the, to your point about parental controls, yeah. I know so many parents who have gotten into these battle royales because the kids hack all the parental, yeah. they can figure them out. This they know all their passwords. Exactly. They know, they That's know another one of my complaints about parental controls is that kids are way savvier than we are. So yeah. it doesn't solve the problem. Like, well, I think, but that's a huge problem though, yeah. is that the kids are so much smarter yeah. because we were not raised with this. We are the no. first generation of parents exactly. who are like, I don't 
don't know. We didn't have to do any of this. Instagram is still a novelty for us too. Yeah. So is TikTok. Yep. We like doing the dances and we like doing all the things yep. and yep. it's all new to us. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I remember, you know, we used to program the VCR. Do you remember that for okay. our parents? Like that was our tech savvy. So why we aren't surprised. I mean, parents tell me all the time that their kids have figured out the loophole and they don't know what to do. And I, I'm in a whole bunch of social media groups that are always going on and on about, well, what parental controls? And I tried this and then I had to do that. And oh my gosh, I don't want to live like that. <laughs> like that trying to keep, exhausting. You're like trying to keep one step ahead of a, of a little yeah. hacker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it doesn't, it doesn't teach them the media literacy and it doesn't give you the relationship piece that is so important for the parenting child dynamic. So before we end, and I, I mean, literally I could sit here and talk to you about this Me all day. Too. I want to talk a little bit about the threat of taking away a phone mm -hmm. because I have read and heard, you know, our kids are depressed. They are isolated, mm -hmm. especially taking it back to these last two COVID years, the, the screens and the messenger and the text string that has been their form of communication. Yeah. It seems to me like threatening to take away the phone would do more harm than yeah. good Yeah, in a lot of cases. So yeah. how do you recommend having those conversations about, around setting limits and what happens yeah. when they violate limits? Because to me, a key piece too is recognizing we screw up on social media. Yeah. I mean, how many celebrities every day get right. screwed on deleted tweets that they did 10 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. We all make mistakes. Mm -hmm. How do we allow our kids to screw up and they will mm -hmm. without threatening to take away this one yeah. lifeline? So one thing I always say to parents is don't use screen time to punish, reward, or incentivize. And that is a hard thing because how many of us have said, if you don't do X, you lose screen time. Or if you want screen time, you have to do X. I just said it to my daughter yep. today. And again, I'm full disclosure here. That's something I still struggle with, but here's why I recommend not doing that all the time. And I always tell parents, we're going for 80, 20 here, like 80% of the time parenting the way we want to parent 20% of the time we're going to mess up because that's life. And actually I had a pandemic exception, which was like 60, 40. So I think we're maybe- that's, a, That sounds reasonable. Yeah. I think we're back to like 70, 30 <laughs> now maybe, but- the problem is if I make screen time that powerful, it's the thing that can be taken away, given its power is so vast, then it will always be a fight. Always. So if, here's something interesting. If you can't think of anything else that has that much power over your child, here's the question again, are we okay with that? Right? And then we want to think about, oh, Maybe they need to be doing some other things so that that screen doesn't have as much control or power over them, right? Again, I always say it's not, ex it's not a little bit of screen time that I'm worried about. It's excessive. And given how many hours at school they're on screens now and how much they're doing at home, we're all bordering an excessive. And so how do we dial that back? Making sure that our kids are participating in other things. So if the screen time's there, are they also doing other things? If the answer is yes, okay, then you can really work this out. There's some kids, the answer is no. And, and again, I don't, there are definitely times where like a clinical support is needed, whether it's therapy or medical mm -hmm. intervention. And I, I am not those things. So I am definitely speaking to the middle group here, but let's not give screen time any more power than it already has. And so part of this is keeping really positive about how we talk about it. And we need to start by paying attention to how we talk about screen time. So is it always a conflict? Do you ever talk about the good stuff? Or, and again, I know I said, it's not all good, but there are some things. So, so Minecraft, for example, my daughter loves Minecraft. It drives me nuts. There's no end, right? This is right. the, this is persuasive Infinite. design, right? Infinite. You can go forever, literally till you die. So when a time is up, we do, we do the timer. I give the five, you know, it's verbal warning sometimes. And more often than not, what I have to do is literally physically sit next to her, put my hand on her knee and be like, okay, I'm here. I'm, sim I'm symbolizing the transition. But before we stop, would you please show me what you made today? How often do we do that? where we connect with our kid about what they're doing. We're really quick to judge it and say, this is stupid, what a waste of time while we scroll through Instagram. But there is an opportunity for connection here. And I promise that if you spend five minutes talking to your kid about, I don't care, it might be the most boring game in the entire world in your opinion, but you pretend it's the most interesting thing and you just listen to them. Tell me about what you made. Tell me why you like that. Show me how you did that. Okay, now it's time. Let's turn it off it decreases 
I'm not saying it won't result in the meltdown because remember the hijacked neural pathways, but that helps. And that's really valuable because again, you're also then getting the connection piece. And so often I'm afraid screen time is displacing moments of connection that we have with our kids. And, you know, I think even about things like getting in the car after school and kids popping in earbuds or scrolling through phone. That's not what it used to be. That car ride was some of the most valuable moments of parenting. It might only have been five minutes, but very valuable because it can go anywhere. You kind of had to talk. You didn't have to look at each other in the eye. So much value to that. So again, are we okay with that, right? Where, where do we draw the line with what we're okay with? And there's going to be exceptions. Again, I know people might, you know, message you and say, yeah, but what about this? And there's always exceptions, but again, 80, 20. Emily, I really equal parts. I'm really annoyed that this all comes back to parenting. (laughs) And I'm so grateful for that perspective because I mean, even that example of Minecraft is so profound. I really, we need to figure out how to enter into our kids Mm -hmm. world a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so much of it is online. It's like, where can you kind of fit in Mm -hmm. as a parent? But when it all starts with us, it's, it's an ugly, it's an ugly mirror when you're like, dang it, Mm -hmm. I do scroll a lot. And I scroll while we're supposed to be watching something together. Oh yeah. Family movie night is one screen, one family. Yeah. Not my kids, everybody on their own screen. I, I would argue my kids would rather do that than just about anything by themselves. Like there oh. is a very real pull for family movie night because they know that we are all going to have that shared experience. But there, to your point, that's not all screen time is the same, right? And, right. And, and that is so powerful. And I always say to families, like family movie night can be a really great connecting moment you can do those and not feel guilty about it. Yeah, absolutely. But you, mom and dad can't be sitting there on their phones during family movie night. That doesn't count as family movie night. So call it what it is, but don't call it family movie night. (laughs) Yeah. Right? Be intentional. Yeah. My daughter was sick and I finally sat down and watched Encanto with her. Oh, I loved it. And she was laughing at me because I was just bawling at the end. (laughs) But I mean, you know, we have the chance to connect with them on the stuff they love. And you're like, oh yeah, like I get why you love that movie. That is a deeply profound experience to share with your kid. But you know, it was at three o'clock in the afternoon. I had a bunch of other stuff to do. And you're just like, you know what? Okay. We're just going to watch this movie together. Yep. But, um, but I appreciate your perspective so much, even though it's annoying and (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) And it makes me look at myself in a different way. And that's really hard, but there's so much work here. But as I am on the precipice of having to make these decisions with my kids, I want them to know, and I want them to know that this stuff is programmed to keep their eyeballs on it. And, and I use this, I mean, as I said, this social dilemma had like a pretty big impact on me Mm -hmm. because I felt so clueless. Like Mm -hmm. I didn't understand what YouTube was or how it was programmed or how it was written. And I got really angry. And I told my son, I said, YouTube is trying to think for you. Mm. Do you want a computer thinking for you Mm -hmm. or do you want to choose what you look at? Yeah. And when you frame it like that, it kind of made him think a little bit where you're like, Mm -hmm. oh, Mm -hmm. I don't want a computer to think for me. Mm -mm. And I don't want Instagram to think for me either, but it is. Yeah. Yeah. And so knowing that moving forward is going to help us all be better people. And also- hopefully someday there will be legislation that we can vote on as people saying we don't want this this way anymore. Or that the companies are responsible for protecting children. At the end of the day, you can't make a product that's for children and not protect them. I mean, that's, that's my feeling. Yeah. Well, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you for what you're giving parents. These are real tools. And as I said, the screen time consultant YouTube channel is wonderful. And your daily tips are so really, really, truly helpful. I'm going to link everything in my show notes, obviously. But if you are a parent, take what Emily said to heart. It is never too late. 
um, to go back and reevaluate your family values. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had Dr. Kate Monahan on the podcast and we talked about parenting to your value cake. Mm. And there are, you know, three, we're trying to parent to everything right now. Yes. Pick three things. Love it. And if tech intentionality can make that value cake, Mm. I think we'd all be more reflective Mm. about how we use it. Yes. I love that. And, and yeah, I I always say pick three, don't pick 50. You'll never get it all done. It's It's too too overwhelming. overwhelming. (laughs) Yeah. It's too over. We're already overwhelmed enough. Exactly. But thank you for being there for us. And thank thank you for giving tangible things that we can apply in our real lives. I so appreciate your tips and I've turned my notifications off after watching your video. And I have to tell you, it's (gasps) life-changing. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank yeah, you. It really, yeah. it's been really great for me, even just in the week that I've done it. Awesome. So, well, thank I you for having you. me. For yeah, this was so fun. I know, do it anytime. actually, <laughs> in person. All right, well, everybody, yeah. you can find, Emily, tell the people where they can find you. Well, ironically, online, of course. <laughs> I have a website, thescreentimeconsultant.com. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, pretty much are the main ones. And YouTube. Yeah. And I will have that. And then a couple of the articles that we discussed up on my website and in my show notes as well. So find her, use her tips, and hopefully we can all come out of this more rational people. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. So admittedly, I feel really lucky I haven't given my fourth grader a phone or watch. I'm taking Emily's advice deeply to heart and will continue to delay, delay, delay for as long as I possibly can. This will probably be a tough path, but I feel like it's right for our family. I can't help but wonder if the pendulum is going to start swinging this way towards more conservative social media and technology rules, but I don't know. As adults, we have to curb our own behavior And I have to wonder if Instagram has a more powerful pull on most of us than we realize. Are we going to be able to moderate our own online behavior for our children? Will we wake up and realize that this is actually horrible for all of us, the way we did to cigarettes? Time will tell. In the meantime, I'm sheltering my kids from online FOMO for as long as humanly possible. I've been burned and depressed about things I've seen on Instagram more times than I care to name. It's a little embarrassing. As much as I don't want to believe it doesn't affect me, it absolutely does. I've narrowed my usage to my podcast Instagram, which ironically, I feel like I can be most fully myself on. I've curated a feed that uplifts and inspires me, but it doesn't include a lot of my friends in real life for this exact reason. The more I know what people around me are doing, the more I feel like I'm not doing enough. And I already feel like I'm not doing enough. I just want to laugh. I want to find content that I love, like pandas, dogs doing things, things that I can watch with my kids. But I'm 43 years old. I've learned how to block out the FOMO to a degree. And after my chat with Emily, it's so clear that I cannot expect my 10-year-old to regulate these really complex feelings when I'm still working on perfecting this skill as an adult. I'll let you know how it goes. But for now, I'm including my kids in my tech use by trying to live more out loud, and trying to put my phone down at night. Baby steps. You can find Emily at thescreentimeconsultant.com and also find her on her YouTube channel, which is amazing. She provides little two-minute, easily digestible tips for parents every day. Thank you once again to my sponsors, John Gruse with Element Mortgage and Johnson & Walker Real Estate. Please leave a five-star review anywhere you listen to this podcast and ask some more questions this week. You never know what's going on right in front of your face.